Good morning. It's good to see everyone here this morning. Um, we are going to start by singing um, a hymn that's fairly, uh, probably new to most of us. Um, it's number 673 in your voices together, and it's called Our God in Heaven. Um, most of it is a cappella, and there's a small part that um, breaks into parts. So we are going to, a quartet is going to sing it through the first time. Um, so you can listen for the parts where we break into parts, and then if you could join us for the second time through. We come this morning into the presence of God. And perhaps there is no better way for us to enter into the presence of God than to do it the way that Jesus' followers have been doing for two millennia. That is with reading together the Lord's Prayer. 
Following this, there will be a time of guided prayer, which uh, will be on our screens. Let's pray together. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one.
on a cold winter's morning, let me extend to you a very warm welcome. For those that are here in our worship center, those who are watching online, glad that you've chosen to worship with us this morning. For those of you who are visiting um, and here in our worship center, we have a tear off that's in that on that back part of the bulletin. We'd love to get a little bit of information. We promise not to abuse this, but let us know who you are. Uh, we'd love to get to know you better. And uh, after our service this morning, I will be out here at the worship center. Would love to talk with you a bit more about Harrisonburg Mennonite Church and our discipleship ministries and other things that we have here at HMC. In terms of announcements, I have two that I want to draw to your attention in the bulletin. The first is that uh, last week we had cold, icy, snowy weather, so we didn't have the Wednesday evening activities. This week we're going to try again that uh, the weather forecast, while may not, may not be the greatest, it's better than it was last week. So um, please sign up for the meal. Hope to see you on Wednesday night. Also, please uh, keep in mind that we're having our annual congregational meeting, which will be in the fellowship hall. That is February the 4th. So uh, please make note of that. A light meal will be provided at 530. The meeting will start at 6. And if you need child care, please let us know so we can arrange for that. The other announcements are in your bulletin. Let's continue our worship this morning with Jesus Be the Center. Follow along on the screen or turn to number 584 in your hymn books to Jesus Be the Center. Good morning, family. Good morning. So good to see you here today. Part of what it means to be church is not just to gather every Resurrection Sunday to remember that our salvation is located in the person of Jesus who died on the cross for our sin and has been resurrected to new life. 
and has invited us into that. But it's also to remember who we are. We are a signpost, a witness to those in our community and in our world. I want to invite Woody and Regina Driver to come up. They have been going out as emissaries for Christ in, um, I always want to say Indonesia. It is the Philippines. I'm sorry. In the Philippines. So they're going to share a little bit about uh, their trip coming up next week. So Thursday morning, uh, this will be the first year the full group has went. It's a medical mission. Uh, we have surgeons, dentists, uh, anesthetists. We, we, we basically take over a clinic, a hospital in the northern Luzon uh, island. <clears throat> so uh, Thursday, uh, 44 of us will be trying to descend on Manila. And then we will then take a 10-hour bus ride north to our site and spend a week there working. Um, so, yep, Thursday morning we're, we're leaving again. This will be uh, 10 years since our first year. Um, and what we do when we get there, um, for those of you who know us, we are in the hearing um, business, so um, that's what we share with those folks. So doing hearing testing, um, hearing aids, um, it's a service that is just not available in the area, so um, we, we take that to them. Um, and yeah, as Woody said, this will be um, not quite an anniversary, but it's been 10 years that we've, um, that we've done this and um, starting to really feel like um, we know what we're doing finally <laughs> um, and, and being able to um, provide services in a way that is meaningful to, to these folks. <clears throat> Thank you guys for being an extension of us who are going to stay here in snowy Virginia. I want to offer a blessing to you. May the Christ who walks on wounded feet walk with you on this road. May the Christ who serves with wounded hands stretch out your hands to serve. May the Christ who loves with a wounded heart open your hearts to love. May you see the face of Christ in everyone you meet, and may everyone you meet see the face of Christ in you. God's grace and peace. Thank you, guys. <clears throat> and I'd like to invite Luis Padilla up. Luis, uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Luis to you as our HMC intern this semester, but many of you know that he was an intern in the fall as well, and I did a terrible job of not introducing him. So sorry about that, church family. Uh, but Luis has been working with our Wednesday night program with both uh, high schoolers and junior high and, and also uh, our community kids. He's been offering and learning to do some pastoral care among us and has been working with Mark Harmon on rebuilding our mentorship program. So we're super grateful to have Louise serving with us again here in the spring. And I'm also going to read a blessing over you as well. Louise, may God bless you with a restless discomfort about easy answers, half truths and superficial relationships so that you may seek truth boldly and love deep within your heart. May God bless you with holy anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people, so that you may work tires, tirelessly for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless you with the gifts of tears to shed with all who suffer from pain, rejection, and starvation, so that you may, be, may reach out to bring comfort and transform pain to joy. May God bless you with enough foolishness to believe that you really can make a difference in this world so that you are able with God's grace to do what others claim cannot be done. God's grace and peace on you. We'll continue in our worship by singing Seek Ye First, number 417. Um, and we are going to sing verses 1 and 2 through all together. And then we're going to sing 1 and 2 again. And any of the people who would like to add in the descant um, the second time through would be great.
please turn with me to number 570, and please stand if you're able um, to join in when we walk with the Lord, number 570. Grace and peace to you, sisters and brothers. It's really good to see you today. So if you were with us last week, you may remember Jake reminded us that though he and Julie have two children, they didn't get to have a conversation with those children until quite a while after they were born. Some children may begin to learn words around 18 months, a few precocious ones maybe earlier. Others take much longer to begin with individual words and then the art of stringing them together. But if you've been around children who are learning to talk, you know it can be delightful, it can be hilarious, and sometimes it can be frustrating. And I think one of those reasons is uh, because one of the easiest words for children to learn is what? No. no. And they like to use it because they very quickly figure out that there's power connected with that word, even though it's only two letters. There's another word 
that children tend to learn around the age of two, that's also very powerful. What comes to your mind? Mine, 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 mine. So for extra credit, you combine those two words. No, mine. I want you to watch for that this week. In those two words, which start so young, I think we learn a lot about human nature. We learn about how we really, truly are hardwired. Because most of us, when push comes to shove, would like things to go our way. We would like it to be mine. We would like to say no. Now, maybe we communicate this more subtly than yelling, no, mine, in the sandbox. But the root message is often the same. We want things our way, on our timing. And we don't hesitate to communicate this to the people around us. And we often do not hesitate to communicate this to God. No, it's mine. So how interesting is it that in this prayer, where Jesus is teaching his disciples how to pray, he focuses on teaching us to pray for God's kingdom, not ours. God's will, not ours. Jesus teaches us not to say no, but yes, yes. He teaches us to say, not mine, but yours, yours, Lord. Yes, your kingdom, God, come. Your kingdom, come, God. Your will be done, not mine. The IVP commentary says, true people of the kingdom live for God and not for themselves. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. New Testament scholar John Koenig says this, every day in countless languages, in public and in private, in virtually every country of the world, this prayer is ascending to God. It could be argued, he says, that no single minute passes in the day or the night when this prayer is not being uttered somewhere. But paradoxically, he also says, we could argue that very few of the people who pray this prayer have a clear notion of what they're asking for. And if you're like me, these words which are familiar and comforting, I can also just kind of zip through them without thinking a bit about what they might mean. Especially when I get to this phrase, your kingdom come, your will be done. So let's start by asking, what is God's kingdom? Jesus, you might remember, talked a lot about the kingdom of God, and he often used parables to do it. And several summers ago, we had a whole series on parables, and many of them focused on the kingdom. He said things like, the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. He said, the kingdom of God is like yeast. He said, the kingdom of God is like a treasure hidden in a field. It is like a priceless pearl. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom. Jesus said, seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness. He said, the kingdom of God is near. And then he said, the kingdom of God is in your midst. So the kingdom of God is here in our midst this morning. Jesus said, the Father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. What a gift. We don't have to earn it. The Father has been pleased to give us the kingdom. These are just small samples of many, many scriptures that talk about God's kingdom. I think that when we pray, your kingdom come, we are trying to learn to submit to God's way in our lives and in the world. And submission has almost become a difficult, confusing word that people don't like to use very often. But what does it mean for us to learn to submit to God's way? We are called to let go of our preconceived ideas about what our family and our job and our life and our church should look like. We are called to let go of the so-called clarity, what we think we have, 
about issues related to church politics or the country's politics, we are called to submit to a higher power. And anyone who's part of a 12-step program knows what it means to talk about submitting to a higher power. We are expressing, when we pray these words, we're expressing a commitment to learn about Jesus' way, to follow in Jesus' way, not our own way. But still we ask, well, what does God's kingdom look like? I think that most often the kingdom does not come with a big bang, but rather with a still, small voice. It is as tiny as a mustard seed. That's barely noticeable at first. But then this kingdom work, it adds up over time. It grows and it grows like yeast. So maybe it's easier to name some things that are not the kingdom. I'm going to name three. I'm sure you can think of many, many more. If we think about some things that are not the kingdom, maybe that will help us to open our eyes to see when we are seeing the kingdom breaking in. So I would say the kingdom of God is not hunger or famine caused by selfishness or drought or minimum wage poverty or bombing and war. That is not the kingdom of God. But the kingdom of God can be seen in countless places around the world. And I'm going to name just one that is local, and that is Patchwork Pantry. Here in Harrisonburg, nearly every single Wednesday night since 1996, local households from local Mennonite churches have gathered together to pool their time and energy to share food. This pantry operates out of Community Mennonite Church. On an average Wednesday, it takes 30 volunteers, and some of them come from you folks. I am told that since the beginning of 2020, I couldn't get numbers for the whole history, but just from 2020 till now, Patchwork Pantry has served almost 10,000 families. This is a sign of God's kingdom coming. It's yeast, and it's growing. And it is a sign to me that hunger is not going to have the last word in our world. Another example of the kingdom of God for me, or no, I'm sorry, an example of what it is not. It is not when teachers and students have to gather to try and teach and learn while they're afraid of going to school because of violence. That is not God's kingdom. But every day in our city and county and country, there are committed teachers and school employees and parents and grandparents and neighbors and friends, countless volunteers and employees who don't let fear of violence keep them from working for the good of the children. A large number of volunteers serve in places like cafeterias and libraries and on the playground and in the classrooms and on field trips. And the gift of the time that they give and the patience which grows out of love for and commitment to children and to learning, that is a sign of God's kingdom coming. It is a sign of love. It is a sign that in God's kingdom, learning is not going to be defined by fear. And a third example, an example of the kingdom not coming is screaming and violence that we have seen over and over on news clips from our capital's rotunda. The kingdom of God is not vitriol and hate on social media. Perhaps the kingdom of God was seen this past Tuesday when 150 peaceful Mennonites wrapped themselves in quilts and sang hymns in the House of Representatives Cannon Building Rotunda as they registered their concern about ongoing violence in Gaza and Israel. That is a glimpse of God's kingdom for me. Cesar Garcia from Mennonite World Conference says this, in the end it will be God who brings healing to our nations. God will bring healing to our nations. And we live into that hope by praying, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
and by following the nonviolent way of Jesus. And until then, we cry out, God have mercy. So the kingdom of God is very often found in the consistent, faithful efforts of followers of Jesus. Many of you show up day after day or fly to the Philippines or work Wednesday night with young people and offer your gifts of time, even though they're imperfect. They're still beautiful. Biblical scholar Father William Burton says this, each act of loving kindness, each attempt to live the way Jesus taught us, shows us and others that the kingdom of God is here among us. It's running quietly in God's love-filled creation just beneath the surface of our consciousness. Retired professors William Willimon and Stanley Hauerwas from Duke University say, we, you and I, we are living, breathing evidence that God has not abandoned the world. I should get an amen, Jake would say. We, we are living, breathing evidence that God has not abandoned the world. And we are able continually and fervently to pray that God's kingdom come. Because we know that God's will has been done. But the truth is that the kingdom is already and not yet. And so the second part of the quote is, we are also able to be honest about all the ways in this world is not the kingdom of God in its fullness. And we hope for more because we know that God's will has yet to be done. God's kingdom has yet to come. So we can celebrate and embrace what is and we can long for and pray for what is to come. I want to tell a little story that I know I, I told at the women's retreat and maybe I've told some other places. So if you've heard me share it before, this just means God wants you to think about it again. Okay. Um, it's one of my favorites. My students heard me tell it a lot. Catholic priest Henry Nouwen has a wonderful little book about prayer entitled With Open Hands. In that book, there's a story of an elderly, disheveled, homeless woman with a long trench coat that's brought into a psychiatric hospital, and they're trying to admit her, and her hands are clenched so tightly. And they try to talk her into unclenching her hands. And in the end, it takes several people to unclench her hands, because I think on some level, she probably felt like whatever she was holding onto was the only way to hold on to herself. Eventually, they got her hands open, and they found a small coin. I would like you right now to take your hands, if you're comfortable, and clench them as tightly as you can. And for extra clenching credit, you could clench your teeth, too. <laughs> Just make your body all tight. And see how that feels. Think about how that feels. And then envision Jesus coming and touching you or a loving friend coming and touching your hands and your jaw and unclench and see how that feels. Henry now and compares this to how we approach prayer. He says, we frequently come to God holding on so tightly to our anger, to our fears, to our anxiety, so tightly because we don't really believe God could handle it if we opened up our hands and let go of those things. We trust our own ability more than we trust God's. When we're holding on that tightly, there's very little room for prayer. How are we supposed to hear God? Where is the space for God to speak if things are all tight? In that posture, it's almost impossible to pray for God's kingdom to come. It's almost impossible to pray for anything. So now and says the first step to the way of prayer, and our five Sunday series is called the way of prayer. He says the first step is to open our hands. And if you can't see it from where you're seated, after worship, come up and look at the table. I have a pair of wooden hands that I take around that I use with this story. If we want to submit our will to God, if we want to pray your kingdom come, your will be done, 
We have to build our lives on trusting God. We have to throw our lot in with Jesus and his kingdom. We need to do it again and again and again. And it starts by opening our hands and our hearts to let God in. That is the heart of the Lord's Prayer. It is the heart of the way of prayer. Frederick Beekner once said, if we only had eyes to see and ears to hear and wits to understand, we would know that the kingdom of God is as close as breathing and as is crying out to be born. It is crying out to be born in ourselves and in the world. The kingdom of God, he says, is where our best dreams come from and our truest prayer, and it's where we belong. He says the kingdom of God is home, and whether we realize it or not, sisters and brothers, we are all homesick for God, homesick for God's kingdom. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, in his book, The Cost of Disciples, said, in Jesus Christ, his followers have witnessed the kingdom of God breaking in on the world. In the midst of the dying and torn and thirsty world, something becomes evident to those who believe in the resurrection and the law of death is shattered. Here the kingdom of God comes to us in our world. This is the event that kindles the prayer for the kingdom. God's kingdom is the kingdom of resurrection. And that's why Jake gets up here and reminds us that every Sunday is a Resurrection Sunday. I will close with one more story. Four years ago, when I was a newly graduated social work major, I still can't believe I can say that sentence, 40 years ago I was a new graduate, um, and I did a term of voluntary service at an emergency shelter program in Ocean City, Maryland, run by Allegheny Mennonite Conference. The conference minister at the time was Irv Weaver. Some of you may uh, know Irv. He died recently, and the funeral was at VMRC 10 days ago, and we had the privilege of attending. So among other things, I had the responsibility at this shelter to screen people who called or showed up at the door to determine who might qualify for emergency food and shelter as we were set up to offer it. I remember distinctly one night when I took a complicated call and I did not feel like I handled it well. And I thought maybe I had allowed myself to be conned or taken advantage of by this caller. That perhaps I was offering services that we really didn't have approval to offer. Later, I debriefed this situation with my supervisor who was a trained social worker and a pastor. That was Irv Weaver. And I have remembered his words for the last 40 years. He said to me, Carmen, when you are in this kind of business, I think meaning a helping business, you should almost always be conned at least once a day. <laughs> I have come to think of that comment as a kingdom comment. Perhaps it doesn't sit well with professionalism or some of the training I received, it speaks on the side of erring on compassion, the side of erring with compassion. It speaks of making room for transforming love. It invites me to think about how God might respond to a difficult need rather than to focus on how I might respond, rather than to focus on the words mine or no, to focus on yes and yours Jesus taught us to pray, God, let your kingdom come, let your will be done, not my kingdom, not my will, not my timing. So this week, may you unclench your fists and your teeth. May you offer your small, clammy coins and join in God's vision for your life, in God's vision for this church, in God's vision for the kingdom throughout the world. May you be eager to say yes, not no. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Join me in a prayer. Oh God in heaven, teach us the way of prayer and teach us the way to live and give us hearts of courage to walk in the ways of your kingdom May the desire of your heart for the world be done in us 
by us, and through us. Amen. Thank you, Carmen. Um, let's continue thinking about those open hands and letting go by turning to number 585, Faith Begins by Letting Go. And number 416, Beyond a Dying Sun.
and number 710. This is my song, 710. It might be new words, but you will recognize the, the tune. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We get to be a part of this. We get to be the ones who live into the kingdom now, even as we wait for the kingdom to come. And one of the ways that we do that is with supporting the work that God has called us to, because we believe God has called us as Harrisonburg Mennonite, as a community of faith, to engage with God in worship, with each other in discipleship, and with our neighbors in friendship. And as we live out into that mission, one way that we do that is through the giving of our tithes and offerings. It's a way in which we all can participate in what God is doing. So I invite you to read the offering litany with me, and then as you leave, if you are prepared, we have boxes at the exits that you may put your offering in. You may also give online. Uh, and for our visitors who filled out one of these little tear-offs, you can drop those in that offering box as well. Let's read this together. Holy One, as you are faithful to us, may we be faithful to you. Faithful with our time and energy. Faithful with our possessions and wealth. Receive these gifts 
by your grace, multiply and use them through the power of the Holy Spirit to make real your reign of love, justice, and peace in our world. Amen. I invite you to stand as you are able. And if you feel comfortable, you could spread out your hands. Is this mic not working, Derek? Okay. How about this one? We lost them. There we go. Okay. Um, if you wish, spread out your hands. If you wish, you could leave them clenched or you can leave them in your lap. As you leave this morning, I invite you to reflect on what you're wanting to let go of. Resentment, fear, anxiety, you know what it is. Trust that into God's care. May God place into your hands hope, healing, a sense of purpose and clarity, renewed relationships. And as you and God navigate the give and take of letting go and grasping and bringing back just like a kid, come back to the image of children um, playing in the sandbox and learning to share. This week, may you say yes to God. May you share. May you say yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Not my will, but yours. God bless you and keep you. God's face shine upon you and God give you peace. Amen. Number eight. Please turn to number three, 809. Sing a new world into being. And this will be our closing hymn um, as we go out into our week thinking of the words that Carmen has given us. Thank you, Carmen. Thank you.